uh, get involved in communal work. It's not a um, part-time thing. It's not something you start and hope somebody else will necessarily continue. You have a responsibility. Um, other people um, put their trust in you. They put their faith in you. Ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome once again to the Changemaker series, a series of one-on-one -on -one talks with none other than Robert Katz. The series hopes to inspire, to inspire each and every person who participates to make a difference in a positive way, to inspire each and every person to realize that they can make a difference in a positive way. Tonight, we have the honor of hosting a very special guest, Mr. Mark Lavner, to say that he and his family, or he and or his family have had a positive impact is really is an understatement. The truth is to do justice to an introduction for tonight, we would need to spend the whole show introducing this evening. There are so many wonderful initiatives, programs, activities that will be touched upon this evening. It's truly an inspiring story and I hope that there is much inspiration drawn from this experience and that many, many will feel even more enthusiastic to do more good. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rob Katz. Thank you, Rabbi, and a warm welcome to our guest, uh, Mark Labner. Um, also, a very, very warm welcome to our viewers, and a special warm welcome to those viewers that are joining us for the first time. As always on the show, please feel very, very free to use the chat and question um, links on, on, the, on the system. To the extent that the um, comments stroke questions are relevant and uh, are not going to be spoken about in the show. I certainly will make every endeavor, as I always do and try to, to put them to our guests. So for those joining, sit back and enjoy. I'm sure that you're going to really, really enjoy tonight's show. It really, really should be and will be a very, very powerful experience. Mark, a special warm welcome to you. As the rabbi said, we can't do justice to, to what the Labna family uh, which is now in its actually fourth generation uh, with your daughter getting involved uh, in one hour. It's just not possible. So we're not going to even try and, uh, and even do justice. What we're going to try and do is, is do the best that we can, knowing that we can't uh, do proper justice. You can't take four generations of, 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 of a commitment into one hour and say you've done it. So that's probably the biggest compliment that I can possibly give you and your family. But we're going to have a bash at doing the best that we possibly can. So, Mark, a warm welcome to you, and thank you so much. This is not your first time on the show. You were on the show uh, as you. a bigger role with, with, with Solly Croc, but now it's your show, and a warm, warm, warm base welcome to you, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Robin. Uh, certainly, I and my entire family are very honoured and somewhat humbled, frankly speaking, that you should dedicate an entire show to us. So if we could switch to commercial breaks as often as possible, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> no, 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 Mark. There's no time for commercial break. We've only got an hour and we've got to bang it in. And uh, it really, really is our honor and great privilege to host you uh, on behalf of, 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 of the work that you yourself have done and on, on, on behalf of your family. But I want to start right at the beginning. 1903, your grandfather came to South Africa from Lublin, Poland. Um, for those viewers who don't know, Lublin, Poland uh, is, 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 is a sweet and sour in, in, in certainly 20th century Jewish history. In 1930, uh, Rabbi Meir Shapiro uh, founded the Chochmei Lublin Yeshiva, which was, the, was, was where the Daf Yomi program came from. So that certainly is the highlight of, of Lublin um, from a Jewish point of view. Um, the low light is without a doubt the 
Nazi death camp uh, on Polish soil, Majdanek. So it certainly is a an illustrious uh, city which, uh, which 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 reverberates even today in this third decade of the 21st century um, in in world Jewry, and both from our loss and from our gain in the Daf Yomi program. So Mark, your grandfather certainly did come from a a a. a an illustrious town, which has, which, which, which certainly uh, reverberates uh, throughout the Jewish history. Um, he came to South Africa in 1903 as a penniless immigrant. I'm always intrigued, and it really is inspirational for me how people who come uh, to foreign countries with absolutely nothing, not even the language, basically the clothes on their back and not much more else, um, rise to success. And that's where I just like to start in. Uh, the first generation of Labners who came to South Africa, namely your grandfather. And if you could just talk a little bit about your grandfather leading into, into your father, uh, um, uh, Bertie Labner and your, um, uh, and your uncle, and then we'll take on the show from there. Just a bit of background as to how the Labners came to South Africa. The origins of uh, Lublin, um, which is where my sort of grandparents' parents came from. Correct, um, correct. So and my grandfather, you're quite has, right, arrived in 1903. Yes, yes. And it has, it, it, you know, it, it has the good and bad of Jewish history in the 20th century. It has the, the um, yeah. Rabbi Ma Shapiro, Chuchmei Lablin Yeshiva, which was the, Duff, the start of the Duff Yomi program started there. Um, but uh, tragically, Majdanek, the Nazi death camp on Polish soil, was also there in Dublin. So it's, it's the good and the bad of the Jewish history, and that's where your, your grandfather came from. And I'm always intrigued, Mark, as to the success of people in immigrant countries, be it South Africa and other parts of the world, where immigrant um, people come not even speaking the local language. They come basically with the clothes on their back and they, that they manage to succeed. And I think that that's a lesson for all our viewers to start off with is that how did your grandfather succeed so much in, in, in generating such, such a family, uh, A, in business and B, in, in the Tzedakah world? You know, Rob, I think one of the things that uh, my late uh, grandfather, uh, Mori, possessed was a very simple set of outlooks on life. He was a very much black and white person. When it came time to work, he worked hard. When it came time to spend time with family, he focused on family. And you know, what's happened, I think over the years, so many of us get so involved in so many activities, we're not able to truly stay focused. You know, the theme really, um, Rob, that um, we agreed we would talk about would really be the intergenerational um, role uh, that philanthropy plays. And um, I'm you know, very, very blessed and very, very honored that um, you know, every member of our family uh, for now four generations <clears throat> has been engaged in uh, community work of one sort or another. Um, you know, and I, I include, as you see, in that list of pictures, a guy who's actually become part and parcel of our family, Arnold Foreman, because he's played such an integral role in our various different philanthropic efforts. He's very much the guy who sits in the back office who doesn't often get kudos, and yet he is so integral to everything that basically we do. Um, as the, the theme really was to try and reflect the fact that uh, Murray established some very fundamental issues around which both business family and community life were formed. And it was important, and in fact, he dictated, quite frankly, that when we were sitting talking business, we spoke business and we did not talk family. When the business <clears throat> discussions ended and we were talking family, we talked family and we did not talk anything else. Invariably, the family and the business were inter intertwined. But equally, when it came to community, the importance of focus. And that's why I think one of the themes really has been that the family haven't just necessarily, you know, given money, they've, they've been raised on having to give time, given themselves. And that's a very, very important ingredient, I think, in any philanthropic endeavor. So Mark, I just want to ask a question over there. You know, in the South African community, we know um, your father, Bertie, your uncle, R Ronnie, um, legends in South African business and 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 equally so in the in the communal work, but did it all? It, I'm hearing from you. It started with your grandfather. Is that correct? 
Yeah, you know, my grandfather, as I said, he didn't have money, but as he made money, he had this mindset of necessarily giving tzedakah. Um, but he, 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 um, he was the type of guy, he wanted to be involved. He never ran his business empire from an office. He actually ran it from his car, visiting customers. And he uh, applied the same philosophy to the various philanthropic interests. He couldn't, uh, in terms of number of hours, go and visit all the various different Jewish communal initiatives that uh, the family got involved in. So really, my, my late grandmother, Bella, uh, became the person who would be at the Ark um, pretty much on a daily basis um, for all intents and purposes. So many of the kids who grew up at the Ark, uh, you know, regarded her as a sort of as, 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 as a mother figure. Uh, she was very involved with the Selwyn Siegel. Um, so there was this engagement uh, that went way beyond just simply giving money. I can, I can see that, Mark. Mark, I heard your father talk 20 years ago at a certain board of deputies conference in the old Carlton Hotel, for those viewers who remember those conferences. And I remember your father as a very, very, very passionate speaker. He got up and he spoke about crime and the problem of crime in South Africa. He built a very, very successful business, a worldwide business with your uncle and um, started together with the late Chief Rabbi um, Cyril Harris, Zach Tzadik Livrocha, um, Africa Tikkun. Can you just put a little bit of color around your father and, and your father, what he was like, the man behind the face that we know? Um, he obviously had a passion for business, a passion for communal work. What was he like? What drove him? And, you know, he was obviously a man of high energy to achieve what he did. Um, I think, Rob, you know, to, to, to call him a Duracell bunny would probably be to understate <laughs> the level of energy that uh, my, my late dad had. I mean, uh, we held a meeting at his insistence. In fact, the Saturday before he passed away. Um, the Sunday before he passed away, uh, he, in fact, uh, was doing exercises, uh, you know, in the garden. Um, he, he had this mindset that life had to be lived to the absolute full. You know, interestingly enough, the story that not many people know is that my dad actually wanted to be a doctor. Uh, he, and, and not because, and he couldn't stand the sight of blood. I mean, my father, uh, if he stubbed his toe and it started to bleed, he practically would faint. So he was certainly no hero in that regard. But, but I think it was driven by a desire to actually help human beings. He just had a love for people, and, and, and it was a genuineness. It wasn't a put-on love for people. He, wherever he went, um, he engaged with people in the warmest possible way, you know, whether it was uh, Joseph Takara, whether it was Ronald Reagan, uh, all of whom he had these interactions with, or whether it was uh, Peter Shalaba, you know, who was the, uh, the cleaner, at uh, one of our sites in, uh, in Alexander Township. He, he engaged with people. He, he, he just had that incredible touch, which is so important. And Mark, talking about his, his, his business career, what was his fundamental driver in a business point of view? Any uh, overarching there, there, learnings? There, there, that, there were that no he, hours, Rob. He obviously worked long hours and put in a lot of energy, that's for sure. You know, it was interesting because, you know, um, although he spent his entire life, as I say, active, non-stop, from the minute he woke up, uh, for him to know a quiet moment uh, was really a difficult one. You know, in, in the last few years of his life, uh, he had to go into dialysis. And he actually arranged that his room in which he would go to for dialysis was set up so that he could host meetings. And his secretary would come and meet with him literally minutes after he had been connected up to the dialysis machine. Um, but right towards the very end, uh, his last few months, he would actually use the time in dialysis. My sister Sue used to you know, care for him in the most remarkable and beautiful ways. And she'd bring him music and he'd push the work aside and he would just take time out of life. Uh, to listen to the music. And if there's a lesson that I learned from him is that he was no doubt enormously successful, but it came at a huge price. 
Um, and what he shared with me at the end of his days was that what he regretted was not making more time to spend with family and with friends, um, more, you know, quality time. Um, and in particular, he said, he shared with me that he wanted to spend uh, a lot more time with his kids and that he had deep regrets that he didn't spend uh, the, the kind of time that he would have liked to have. So, you know, from our point of view, um, he shared everything that he did with us. There, it, it wasn't as if he was, you know, an absent father. He might have been physically absent a lot, but he shared pretty much everything that he was doing. Um, even the way he structured his, his will, he created what was called a living will because he wanted to see how would his children behave as beneficiaries of a trust? And would we display the values that he thought were so important? So even to that extent, you know, he wanted to be engaged, um, not necessarily ruling from the grave by any means, but certainly he wanted to see that uh, how his kids were necessarily going to behave with this living well. I, I suppose, Mark, it's always the perennial question of, of, of being successful in business. You know, I think the the days of nine to five are long gone. And uh, unfortunately, as we in the third decade of the 21st century, it's even worse now because, you know, your office is now your iPhone and you're always, you know, 26, uh, sorry, six days a week, 24 hours a day contactable. So, you know, it, it, it you know, the work-life balance is, is, is difficult to get. And, you know, I don't know how you do get success in the work world where it's so relentless this and demanding and still be able to devote all the time that you know that to your family I, I certainly don't have the answer to that but it's interesting very interesting what 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 you said mark on the screen now we're seeing um, a heap load of very very prominent people um nelson mandela um your your father the uh, <laughs> uh, uh, talk us through some of the more famous people that 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 you and your family have been exposed to Oh, gosh, um, that's an interesting question because it really depends on how you define famous. Uh, prominent people, um, there were a number. Um, we and, and the beauty of you know, being um, a family member of Bertie Lovner is you got to know these people uh, more than just uh, in passing. So, you know, uh, through my dad, uh, we we met and engaged with um, uh, Golda Meir. Um, we met uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Um, my dad didn't know it, but there's a function help for Bill Clinton. I got to meet Bono, which was a highlight certainly for me, and, and spent a, a night having dinner with him and his wife, uh, amongst a group of other people as well. Um, but I think... You know, the issue of prominence was invariably replaced by my dad when he used to talk about the qualities that he used to look for in people that he admired. Uh, and very often they weren't necessarily um, world leaders. Uh, they might have been leaders in their field. So for argument's sake, you know, he got very close to some of the, the, the people at Ben Gurion University and we would go out into the Negev Desert and we might meet a scientist there who was passionate about, um, you know, growing uh, fish farms in the desert. Um, or we'd meet, for argument's sake, a doctor who was doing work with the Bedouin community. Um, and, and those were the people that were really regarded as important people, you know, in his life. So in, in answer to your question, I can sort of rattle off a whole bunch of names. <clears throat> people like Mandela, for argument's sake, he did get very close to. Um, and, and a number of the projects that we initiated were initiated in partnership with him. And not just his name, but his actual, uh, Madiba's actual involvement and engagement. Um, uh, so, so I hope that might give you some sort of insight into the answers. He was engaged. He was just, well, whatever he, he did. <laughs> You know, Bertie Bert, won the, the Order of uh, a Meritorial Service um, presented by uh, F.W. de Klerk for the work that he did uh, promoting South Africa. As opposed as he was to apartheid, his attitude was build uh, and remedy and fix from within. So 
he, 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 and he went overseas and he lobbied for South African support and, you know, uh, early days of his involvement with the Chamber of Commerce with Israel. You know, it was constantly trying to make the world a better place um, on a win-win basis rather than necessarily a win-lose basis. Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark, I think um, I'm happy now to to move over to really the second part of the show, which is the uh, legacy of the of, 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 of the Labna family in, in community. Is there anything, Mark, in terms of your family that you'd want that we haven't covered or you feel that you want to come back to uh, any interesting points made that we've yeah. missed? You know, Before Rob, um, th th there is an important one. You know, what I think we, we realize is, you know, coming particularly from a, you know, hardworking sort of family background and environment, often there's lots of competition. And certainly between siblings, um, you know, their three brothers, uh, we, although we're at different ages, um, there's quite a, a degree of almost underlying competition often between us in, in, on the sporting field. We've all gone our own way in terms of our business endeavors. And the one thing that has bonded us all together has been uh, a commitment to philanthropy. So, you know, where I might, for argument's sake, get kudos for, you know, Africa Tikkun's work, the reality of it is that I had the backing, financial and moral, um, of uh, all my family, uh, whether it was my siblings, my mom, my dad, uh, my ex-wife, my current partner, um, you know, everybody that is engaged from a family perspective, necessarily we pull together as a team. It's not just one individual who's out there on their own making it happen. And that gives an enormous amount of fortitude. Um, it gives resilience. Um, it just gives an enormous amount of backbone. Yes, I think that that's a very important point that you make, Mark. Um, you know, my, my late father-in-law was uh, Russell Gadden. Uh, he headed up the South African Board of Jewish Education, headed up the South African Board of Deputies, and he actually played a role on the world stage of jury. And I think what people don't uh, appreciate uh, being in communal work is the sacrifice and the commitment that the family make uh, behind the scenes as you have uh, I wouldn't even say alluded to, you've actually made a strong statement. So, you know, I, I think uh, on behalf of us all, you know, a big thank you to, to the wider Labner family. And as you say, you know, I think you and your father are the more public profile, but everyone else has a role to play as well in, in, in the success Critical. of this all. Yeah, and, I, I, and like I said, I did see it from my own family. Okay, Mark, I'd like to move on. Um, you know, in the in the in the short space that we've got, uh, I don't know how we're going to do justice, but I'd like to deal at least with uh, at least two two of your of your of your projects, uh, Africa Tikkun um, and Smile Foundation. As I said before, Africa Tikkun was founded by your late father uh, Zachet Livrocha and the late chap, uh, Rabbi uh, Chief Rabbi Cyril Harris Zachet Livrocha. Um, tell me. They obviously had a special friendship. They obviously found a need uh, in South Africa at the time. Give us a bit of background to Africa Kun, how it came about, what it does, um, and where we are today with Africa Tikkun. Well, well, you know, the, the original founders, which was my dad and the late chief rabbi, had this vision that um, immediately after apartheid with the Jewish community had to consolidate our efforts to have greater impact. And I think originally Tukun was determined to be a, um, I almost want to call it an Uber overall umbrella for Jewish charitable initiatives, which frankly speaking, Rob, is just not possible. Um, you know, every Jewish individual uh, who runs a charitable organization is a captain. Um, so they yes, just difficult to pull on the book as well, Mark. Yeah. That's also what we want to do. So not only do we, want, also, our, we know, want to run our own charities, we all want to write our own book. <laughs> Correct. Um, but I think also one of the things in the sensitivities I'm going to put on the table was this was, sort of, was the Jewish community's reaction and response uh, to um, people living primarily in township environments. Um, and my dad was horrified. Uh, he had no idea 
Uh, he honestly, genuinely was naive to what uh, the circumstances were in the townships, because you can remember, we were not able to go. So yes. in essence, he started this organization together with Chief Rabbi Harris, Arnold Foreman and Anne Harris and Herbie Rosenberg were also there in the early days, um, uh, launching what was essentially a series of goodwill initiatives in different townships, feeding schemes, uh, helping with education in the Cape, um, a birthing clinic in Deep Slit. And about um, uh, 15 years ago, um, I was in the corporate world um, and looking to make some uh, material changes to my own life. I had gotten involved in some charity work, which is particularly uh, important and, and meaningful to me. And I approached my dad to say, well, you know, um, what about me joining Africa Tikkun? They were looking for a CEO. And so I joined Africa Tikkun, uh, offered my services uh, for a few months on a no-charge sort of basis um, uh, to see if I could prove them with them. What happened, Rob, is I absolutely fell in love with an asset that doesn't appear on any balance sheet anywhere, which is called uh, uh, the Township Youth. It's an incredible spirited group of individuals who truly want to do something with their lives and given half an opportunity, despite the obstacles and the handicaps that apartheid had imposed on them. Because you can all argue it's 25 years since apartheid. But, but the reality of it is, is that these individuals are growing up in an environment with no internet, no electricity, et cetera, et cetera, in a world which had sort of moved uh, very fast forward uh, into the uh, 21st century. So I fell in love with this spirit. And we came up with this concept called um, cradle to career, because I realized that just to have a feeding scheme on its own, well, great. I, uh, my team, I, I use the so what question all the time. So what? So you've got a feeding scheme. So you feed today and create dependency tomorrow. So we came up with this model. Early childhood development would lead into youth development and after schools program where we teach kids to believe in themselves and at the same time give them the necessary supports to make the right life choices. And then when they were assisted both with life skills, as well as academic skills and sporting and social skills, they would then move into a, an area of job experience, work experience. And the world around us was changing very much in our favor. Black economic empowerment uh, was motivating companies to spend more money on enterprise development, skills training, employment of the unemployed work skills programs. So we fitted into that. We had this, these graduates coming out of Africa to Kun's uh, developmental process and going now into a job opportunity. So we formed Africa to Kun Services, a PTY limited company that could help with black economic empowerment scorecards, but at the same time offer these graduates job opportunities. And then to help fund it, we created a private equity arm. Um, and the private equity arm would invest in companies, use the dividends uh, or any capital that was realized to help fund the charity. Because as the charity was growing, sort of leaps and bounds, uh, it, it was quite scary, quite frankly, that we had to rely on corporate contributions and high net worth contributions to fund a budget that was 40 million and then 60 million and 80 million. And when we got to 100 million, we said, oh, we've got to take this private equity stuff much more seriously and, and earn other alternative revenue streams. So the um, group effectively of entities, even though we're not actually formally a group, they're three operating entities, separate legal entities, but we work collaboratively together in what is very much a sort of holistic circle to get kids through a development process into job opportunities, hopefully acquire interest in those businesses and then introduce them to the graduates coming through the program. And that's what we've called our cradle to career model. Uh, which we've now been developing over the last 15 years and are now about to take that national in partnership with the with Minister Zulu, who's seen the model and has requested that together with a number of other organizations, we take what we're doing, not just through our existing six sites, but in fact to new townships across the country. Right. Mark, I'm sure that in the many, many years that you have run Africa Tikkun, and I, I, it would be remiss of me not to point out that you, you came back from the US, you had a very, very successful career in, in 
in corporates, you're a CEO of a listed company and you gave it all up. I know that you're a very, very modest and humble uh, man, Mark, but I'm, I'm, I'm making the point of, 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 of what you've, my wrong word, sacrificed in the corporate word for a heap load more of different kind of value and benefit in the, in the communal world. Is there any particular standout success that really shines a bright light in the world of Mark Labner to say, you know what, due to our family's involvement in, um, in Africa Tikkun, we can see that we've done or taken community this or people this or any one particular individual, whatever, and changed their lives such that that one single project, event, person sticks out as a as a, as, as, as a real legacy or is it just a general uplift in, 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 the, in the communities in the townships? Mm. Yeah, uh, there, yeah. There, 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 there are many, many instances, but there's one that comes to mind because you'll see how it interlinks between, and it's only through an involvement that you can actually get this kind of result. Within the Smile Foundation, the very first young girl that we operated on, the girl by the name of Tanda Manyati, Malambo Manyati, Sorry, Mark. She had a of you. Uh, and I come to Smile Foundation uh, separately, yeah. but perhaps we can come to it now. We should come to it now. No, Do you want to just tell us what Smile Foundation is? Sure, but you, you'll see the link no. in the story. Um, okay. Smile Foundation is an organisation which, um, again, I was very, very fortunate to start with family backing and support uh, about twenty odd years ago, together with Mandela, when uh, he asked that uh, we help with young, one young girl, Tanda Malambo Magnati, who suffered facial paralysis condition. That's her there in the picture. And that she became known as the Mandela Smile Child. She couldn't speak, she couldn't talk, she couldn't chew. And the skill base did not exist in South Africa. So I was fortunate through the YPO network to access um, some of the world's best talents from the States, brought them to South Africa to perform this operation. And I woke up to the fact that if we taught South African surgeons the skill, we would be able to start a program helping other kids. And I started to realize there were cleft palate conditions, burn victims, craniosacral conditions amongst young kids who simply weren't getting access to surgery. So we started the Smile Foundation some 20 years ago. And um, that entity um, works now with um, about 11 different state hospitals across the country. Uh, and bringing about surgical relief. We offer psychological support. We do skills training for doctors and surgeons and nurses. Uh, and so it's really a very holistic approach to helping kids. And one of the young girls, Tando, after her operation was incredibly shy. She didn't want anybody to know that she had this facial history. And um, her speech was not perfect. Her the surgery was not 100% perfect. And so this young girl sort of would often hide behind counters. She wouldn't engage with people at all. And so Tikkun employed her. Tikkun put her through a computer training program and we put her front of house. Today, Tando is the first person that you see when you walk into my office. And she greets you, even though her diction is not perfect. Even though her smile is very skew and her eyes are drooped, she is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful human beings that I get to see every single day I walk into my office. And if ever I need a reminder as to why we do the things that we do, both in Smile, both in Tikkun and various other initiatives, that's the one thing. Rob, it would be really remiss of me, and, and if this is uh, an opportunity for just a personal, very personal thing, you know, my brother... Tony and his wife Susie lost a child, Sabrina. Yes. And uh, my dad implored them to start a charity called Sabrina Love. Very difficult for them. They just lost their child. I, I can think of nothing uh, more wrenching, quite honestly. I don't know how you've ever come to terms with it. But they did by starting Sabrina Love, which looks after other handicapped children in the greater B2 area and provides unbelievable supports from her base as well as into the community, I saw how they were able to resolve so much of the hurt in their own lives. Sabina's never forgotten, but she's celebrated now rather than necessarily only ever thought about 
um, uh, from a tragic perspective. So, you know, another story, if you ask me about somebody who I remember all the time, um, the story of Sabrina and how Sabrina's life touched just so many, many hundreds and hundreds of other children. And not only children living with disabilities, but able-bodied children who can relate to Sabrina. They learn a very important life lesson about the value of life and the value of others. Um, and, and it's really, really commendable what uh, Tony and Susie have done in that space. Right. Mark, just for our viewers, and in fact, for my own edification, I know that you, you, you made reference to the Beto. Beto. Um, I know that that's uh, Plettenberg Bay, but is it wider than Plettenberg Bay? Is it George Neisner or just Plettenberg Bay? Just so that we can just reference where this communal work takes place. Yeah. There, there, there are two very, very large communities in Plettenberg Bay um, where the outreach work stretches to. Um, but I am aware that there are kids that come at times from, you know, far reaches, Neisner, George, uh, for the help and the support. They run a, 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 a base uh, called Sterevac, which is a, a daycare facility. And then uh, particularly during the lockdown, Tony was sharing with me how uh, much of their work necessarily had to be outreach into the community and how that's now become an integral part of the work that they do. And interestingly, it links, there's another link. T Tikkun has a program called, um, what was originally called our empowerment program. We, we realized very quickly that we couldn't provide the OT services such as Sabrina does. So we started a program to teach parents how to look after their kids in shack communities. Today, we've got about 2000 families who are being taught by parents who themselves pass on the knowledge as to what can they do? What OT routines can they affect in the shacks? How can they remodel their shacks? And one woman, in fact, decided to hell with all the social ostracism that goes on in townships with children who live with disabilities. She painted a shack bright purple. So the painted purple concept now is a massive project where corporates donate money to renovate shacks and on those shacks, there's a statement, my son has spina bifida, my son is paralyzed, whatever it might be, and um, boldly within the community, and it gives the community an opportunity to come and, real, and show real Ubuntu and real, really offer support. It's an incredible, incredible initiative of you know, teaching people to fish, and it's amazing how many of the community necessarily gathered together. So we, we together... Um, as a family, we're very involved with the Beit Izzi Shapiro Home in Israel, which is a world leader in how to deal with children with disabilities. And once a year, we bring Beit Izzi Shapiro um, uh, instructors to South Africa, not only to help us with our own programs, but to the Disability Forum across South Africa. So, again, there's that exchange that takes place. Amazing, Mark, amazing. And all I can do is salute 100% all the efforts uh, and, the, and the difference and the changes that you're making in so many, 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 many lives. Mark, I know that we've dealt with Smile Foundation, we've dealt with Africa Tikkun, and we have dealt with Sabrina Lab, which is the ones that I wanted to deal with. And there's a multitude of other initiatives um, uh, that, that the Ludner yeah. family are involved in. Is In the short time that we have available, is there anything else that, that, that you feel you want to highlight in terms of, of communal work? Yeah, you know, Rob, one of the greatest gifts I think any father could ask for is um, uh, to be able to be engaged with, your, with, with their children in some way. Um, from when my daughter was nine years old to Kara, I took her with me to the Jobu Jen Hospital. Um, and so she was with me in the early, early days when Smile first started. And instead of being horrified by these kids that faces burnt off and stuff like this, she would immediately engage, she would embrace, she would hug, she would love them. And that's affected her life enormously. When she went to university in Paris, she started an initiative at American University of Paris, this, you know, very old institution that had no philanthropic outreach. She was the first individual to start a community outreach initiative there at that university, and she won an award. So when she graduated cum laude at this university, showing she worked damn hard, she still managed to find the time to launch a charity to look after street gypsies and to help with Africa Tikkun initiatives. And so she's been very engaged. In fact, 
the last show that I was fortunate to be on, she should have been on, quite frankly, Keep the Wolf from the Door. Um, yes. But she worked very closely with Solly as the project manager, launching uh, that, that initiative. And I know she learned a lot from Solly, and I know Solly equally has expressed, uh, again, an equal admiration in necessary for. So it gives an enormous amount of joy. Uh, I share with my sister, Sue. She does, does amazing work just quietly on her own in Cape Town. Um, also working with individuals who challenged with Parkinson's disease. And she gives of herself. Uh, my brother, Rich, is very actively involved with a charity initiative in India um, that he visits and spends time in and volunteers time. And it's not just giving money. So this philosophy that Mori had, that if you're going to do something, get involved. Don't just, you know, put money to it. That, that logic that drove the success of PG, going to visit your customers, has pervade, I think has been pervasive all the way through to now the work that we're all doing with our philanthropy, where we're very, very hands-on. And, and we have the gift of being able to, in fact, see the rewards uh, that, uh, that, that come from having put in time and effort and money. Amazing. Um, just to remind our, our, our listeners that the Q&A is open uh, and we are open for final comments, great questions to Mark. Mark, um, this is a spontaneous show um, and I like to keep it spontaneous. I don't like a structured formulaic approach to the show. So I am going to ask you a question, which I'm going to give you a bit of time to think about because the last thing I want to do is ever ambush a guest on the show. <laughs> and the question I'm going to ask you, but I don't want you to answer it now, is... You come from a family that's given literally your kishkas to, to communal work, okay, both in the Jewish community and in the wider community in South Africa. The question I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you at the end, is what is the one lesson that our community can learn um, or our listeners can learn from, from you or from your family in terms of what, what is needed going forward, what, what, what is the... If, if there was a Lubna family legacy in one line or one sentence, what would it be? But before, but I'm going to give you time to think about it, Mark. So I'm not ambushing you. I'm not asking you to answer the question now. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, Mark, that just listening to you, I've been intrigued by one point, and it's a common factor that comes to in, in In my knowledge, okay, and it might be, I'm, I'm not saying that I know it. I just don't know it. And it could well be out there that... I've never known a business, a private business into the fourth generation, okay? Public businesses obviously go, they, they're indefinite so long as, 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 uh, as, as they continue. We're talking a private business. I've never known a private business, family business going in South Africa into the fourth generation. Neither have I known a Tadoka organization or a, or, a, or, a, or a charitable trust, whatever you want to call it, into the fourth generation. Your family, the Lubna family, you've made made reference to your daughter Takara, starting from your your grandfather Mori, um, have all been involved in some form or fashion in communal work, which really, really is amazing. So it must, I'd hazard a guess, be in the Lubna gene somewhere to to do it, which really, really is is phenomenal, Mark. And really, I salute, uh, as I said before, I salute the Lubna family for for their contributions to. To South Africa. Is there anything in particular, Mark, in terms of, 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 of let's wrap the show up more or less now, um, in terms of coming to the communal side of thing, or again, visiting, uh, you know, the, 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 the personal side of the Lubners that you'd like to mention, perhaps we, we didn't do justice to it, perhaps we skimmed over issues, now's the time just to think about it and Final comments, final yeah. colouring, so to speak, before the final question. Um, Rob, I think it's, you know, you, you, uh, the lesson really is that when you uh, get involved in communal work, it's not a um, part-time thing. It's not something you start and hope somebody else will necessarily continue. You have a responsibility. Um, other people um, put their trust in you. They put their faith in you, whether it's the parent is bringing their child to us at the Smile Foundation saying, I'm, I'm entrusting my child's future to you guys um, to fix a facial deformity, or whether it's a parent who's dropping their children off at our early childhood development centers in Tikkun. 
you can't say I'm going to do this for five minutes. Why? And, and, and when it no longer feels good, you know, uh, I've got other callings. You, you have to take things responsibly. And to take things responsibly, the one thing I certainly learned from my father was you apply business-like principles. Might be driven by a huge amount of emotion, philanthropy, but for things to be sustainable, you have to necessarily apply business-like disciplines. He used to have what he called the Ten Commandments, which he drummed into us at, uh, 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 at Tikkun. Um, and there were ten codes by which you decided which projects you were going to support and what issues you measured to determine your, your, your long before it was, you know, uh, uh, a popular talk about impact giving and impact phil philanthropy. My yeah. father had these 10 points, uh, which in truth really were about impact uh, and, and using business philosophies around philanthropy. So I think that's a very important theme um, in, in, in tackling any uh, philanthropic venture. Uh, I've seen so much goodwill during this COVID period of time. But at the same time, my request to anybody who is watching the show is everybody wants to do something good. Go, don't go and do it by yourself. Find the organizations that are already established, that have got the community links in place already, and support those. You, you might not get as much recognition, but I promise you the yachis that you're going to get is going to come from knowing that you've done something that is far more sustainable. Yes. And Mark, the final question. Um, yeah. I don't know if you did it there. <laughs> <Thought> <laughs> Rob? Abner's, yeah. You know, in one sentence, what is the Labner family? You know, I think it's fair to say when the final writ is written on South Africa's Jewish community, when the final writ is written, whenever that is, the moment before Mashiach comes, the name Labner will be mm -hmm. right up there amongst the very, very top of contributing yeah. and having an impact on South Africa's Jewish community, the wider community in terms of communal involvement and Sudoka work. What is, what is the final legacy? What's the message we can all take away on the show? You, you, you know, Rob, honestly, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very embarrassed by those comments. I'm very humbled and I'm very grateful because there's so many people that frankly speaking do an enormous amount. We're very blessed. Let, let's be blunt. We are very live in a very blessed situation where we can do what we do, um, and, and 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 each and every single day the rewards that we get back are tenfold. And I don't just say that; I genuinely, genuinely mean it. I think the the one comment that I would make is that, you know, the wellspring of love is eternal, and it's indefatigable. If that makes if that is a word. Um, the more you give, the more there is to give. There is this unbelievable gift that God gives us that if we really look for things, if our, we place our awareness on good things, on good deeds, if we look for the good in people, there's so much good to find. There's always an opportunity to be optimistic, no matter how difficult the situation and circumstances are. Uh, South Africa is in an absolute dwang financially. We're, we really are in a mess. But, you know, I always, remind, I always remind myself, it's people who put us in this mess, and therefore it's going to be people who will take us out of this mess. And if we yes. just all put our awareness, frankly, towards areas of good and things that can be done that are positive, then our energies will flow in that direction. If we spend our lives talking about just how bad everything is, that's where our awareness lies. And guess what's, uh, you know, the end result is going to necessarily be. So my, my appeal is just to, to look for the wellspring of love that does exist in every single human being um, and, and to realize that if we can stoke that, if we can coax that out of people, we're going to do that much more. Yes. Mark, if, 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 uh, if I can sum up over here, um, um, uh, just before I sum up, I've, got a, I've just got a, got a comment over here. Um, working with Mark is inspiring to us all day. We all do better because of him. I've got no doubt <laughs> that 
that that's valid. Mark, before I hand over to the rabbi, we've 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 almost taken the hour, and I think that we've done the best that we can do. As I said, there's no ways that you can you can put four generations of of of, of commitment into one hour. But it, but if if I take my takeaway of this, and that is that the Lubna family um, has been blessed but equally so has contributed and taken that blessing for good and put it to good with enormous passion and commitment. Um, there doesn't seem to be a backward step taken across uh, the generations. It's, it's an amazing uh, thing to see. Uh, South Africa desperately, desperately needs uh, you all to carry on uh, and, and for your example to be spread out for others to, to follow. And my final uh, thing to you, Mark, is just to thank you once again for appearing on our show and Hashem should bless you and your whole family, across your widest family, um, with much brocha and atzlocha and only good things going forward. And you should all be blessed with health and you should stay safe and 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 and, uh, and healthy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so very much. Amen, good. amen. And Rob, please, if I could ask that you extend that sure. blessing to all of those people who work alongside us and all of those people who support us in our homes, uh, because truthfully, we can't do it on our own. Um, we really are, as I say, just, we, we need to extend that blessing to every single member of to any one of our organizations and to those people in our homes. And you're 100% right. Remiss of me not to, and I apologize. Oh, for not guys. at all. <laughs> Wonderful, thank Mark. Thank you very, thank very you. much. Rabbi? Thanks, Rob, and uh, thank you, Mark. And as I mentioned in the beginning, and as Rob echoed, towards the end, to do justice to what you do, Mark, what your family does, has done, a uh, multi-generational endeavor is, is, the truth is one can't really do it justice. Nonetheless, though, it's been an incredible, incredible hour. So if I may, to say thank you to you, Mark, this was most interesting and very inspiring. Thank you for your time, both tonight and leading up to tonight to hear the story of your family, to hear about the amazing programs, the initiatives that extend over four generations, beyond remarkable. And to see your passion and to hear of your family's passion, both in the past and in the present, I have no doubt, by the way, it will continue into the future. It's very inspiring indeed. Hashem should bless you and your family and all those who, who are your partners in all of the incredible work that you do with much continued bracha and atzlocha. It's greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. To a very big thank, thank you. Thank you so well. much. An absolute pleasure. Thank you as well to all those behind the scenes. In no particular order, but uh, first off to none other than Robert Katz. Greatly appreciated, not only for this particular series, but all that you do for our community. Uh, he'll tell me afterwards, I shouldn't, I, I mustn't, but nonetheless, I do. And I thank him. I also want to thank uh, Ariel Weber for his contribution in making this all happen. It's greatly appreciated. To my brother Moshe, again, to say thank you for this evening is to belittle all that you do, literally day and night, facilitating and organizing a tremendous amount of online programming. It's really, really greatly appreciated. Just in relation to this particular series, we've got a very special event next Sunday evening. We have a wonderful session brought to you um, by the experts at Citadel, in particular Andrew, who was a guest in the past on the show, who will be sharing some insights regarding the local economy. That's next Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Thank you all for joining us. It's uh, always a pleasure to see so many people in attendance. Wishing you all well, keep well, keep safe, and have a good night.